What's going on, U.S. history students? Back at it again. Another video. Longer video today. We're trying to get through this as quickly and as efficiently as possible. This video is also going to correlate to your homework assignment, so you kind of have to watch this, right? Um, we're talking about America in the 50s. A lot to cover. We got to talk about a war, and we got to talk about the stuff going on at home in the 50s. So, a lot to unpack here. I'm going to try to do it as efficiently as possible. Let's go. We're going to start with the Korean War. Okay, getting right into it. So this is about five years after um, World War II ends. So after World War II, Korea was liberated from Japan, but it became split up along a line of latitude, right? The globe is on lines of latitude and then lines of longitude, right? So latitude is like, you know, if you were to uh, move up or down, right, on the planet. And it was split at the 38th line, essentially the halfway middle point of the Korean peninsula, the, uh, which is considered the red and green uh, colored parts of that map there. Um, the South became occupied by the United States. And then the North became occupied uh, with, uh, by the Soviet Union. This was kind of the terms of the agreement at the end of the war and you know the winners, right? Get When you win a war, you get to take the other place, country's territories and stuff. And so that's what was agreed upon. But as tensions obviously rose, as we've talked about, between the Soviet Union and the United States, um, this kind of led to kind of the first real battles and the first real war of the Cold War. Um, North Korea, obviously because of the Soviet Union influence, was heavily influenced to become a communist state. Um, and with the United States occupation in the southern part of Korea, it was encouraged and influenced to be more democratic capitalist. Neither would really come to an agreement, North or South, to, hey, how are we going to you know, become a country and what are we going to do? Neither really recognized that border. Both sides wanted to take over the other side and establish one Korea under their way of life. And thus, they fought each other for control of Korea. This would become known as the Korean War. The newly formed UN and NATO nations, along with the United States, backed South Korea. And early on, they almost defeat North Korea. Uh, but China, which is a recently communist country, as well as support from the Soviet Union, um, they came to North Korea's defense. They pushed back against uh, the South Korean forces and the American soldiers who were there. Um, and, uh, you know, China and Soviet Union mostly supplied weapons and aid. The U.S. actually sent significant amount of soldiers over the U.S. And there were some Soviet and Chinese soldiers, but primarily the fighting was between, you know, Americans would be fighting North Korean forces and such. Um, Chinese, Soviet Union, North Korean forces would be fighting South Korean forces. So there was never really like Rus Soviet Russians on American type violence or fighting. Um, so it was very indirect. Um, as the war goes on, it really just became a stalemate. Um, you know, eventually North Korea was able to push the South Koreans kind of back way down and then South Korea kind of pushed them back. And eventually the, it, the, the border, the front was right at where the original border was between North and South Korea. So at a certain point, neither could gain uh, much territory. And after a while, America and even the other countries were like, you know, is this really worth it anymore? The Soviet Union has a nuclear bomb now. We're going to talk about that. Do we really want to keep sending aid and soldiers over to fight a war that we don't really think we can win? And so ultimately, Korea was divided into two countries along that 38th parallel, the North being North Korea and being communist, the South being capitalist and uh, democratic South Korea. It served as a proxy war. Proxy, uh, think of it as like, a, oh, I, I don't know, a artificial, um, indirect war between the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Um, again, the U.S. and Soviet Union didn't really fight directly with each other, but it was more they were like the puppet masters playing with, you know, the U.S. playing with South Korea, Soviet Union playing with North Korea. Um, and this has long lasting impacts to today. Um, North Korea, again, became uh, a communist country and then really became isolated from the world. 
mainly because they had really authoritarian, totalitarian um, leadership. Um, this is Kim il Sun. Um, he convinced people that he was a god. Um, normally in class, I show you videos of the stuff that goes on in Korea, and it's like it's culty. It's like a cult there around this family. Um, that this guy is his grandson. Uh, that's the current leader. Um, and today, North Korea uh, is like the most totalitarian state in the world. Freedoms are really limited. Propaganda is high. Connection to the outside world is pretty much non-existent. Um, most of their country is really malnourished and they live in a really fake reality. Um, if you were to look at satellite images at night of the differences between North Korea and its neighbors, so Japan, China, South Korea, if you look at it at night, there's satellite images. China, South Korea, and Japan, you could tell there's civilization because of all the electricity and lighting. North Korea, almost nothing. One small little dot around their capital. Um, and again, I would show you this stuff in normal year. We just don't have the time. Um, these are the two flags, North Korea, South Korea. The two sides don't really have the best relationships. Um, these are some pictures from the war. Um, going here. That's, this is a kind of a, a special like meeting place or on the border line between North Korea and South Korea. These are South Korean soldiers up there as North Korean soldiers. Um, you can even tell the South Korean soldiers, they look a little bit more modern age than the North Korean soldiers, a little more held back. Um, so that's looking into, uh, that's looking into uh, North Korea over there. Um, we keep going here. That's the borderline, right? Um, these buildings is where they have meetings occasionally. Those blue buildings is where they occasionally have meetings when they need to. Um, it's a very dangerous border, um, you know, and uh, it's a tough, you can go visit and you can look out with binoculars to look into North Korea, but it's very hard to get into North Korea. Um, you know, they're pretty isolated from the rest of the world. Um, and we could go and talk into whole that, but that'll make this video way too long. Um, so we'll just kind of keep going. But just know this is why there's two Koreas. There was a war there. Today, North Korea is still allied with like a communist nation, right? China. Um, some connections to Russia because they share a border. Not as friendly with South Korea, Japan, the United States, or a lot of the other more democratically capitalist nations of the world. First time, though, this was actually recent. Uh, I've added this in the past couple of years. This was about two years ago. President Trump, um, former President Trump and uh, their leader, Kim Jong-il, met with, uh, met. These are the first time that the two leaders of these nations had ever met. Um, but uh, it really didn't amount to much. We still have the same issues today. <laughs> kind of dealing with North Korea. They want to develop nuclear weapons. We don't want them to do that. It's a whole mess of things. Trump tried to de-escalate it, but it's Trump. So he just, in a lot of ways, didn't really do anything. Um, and we're not really in any much of a better position than we were 10, 20, 30 years ago. Okay. I have, hey, watch that video link if you got time. It's about Dennis Rodman, the Globetrotters. They go to North Korea. This was like maybe 10 years ago. It's kind of a trip. It gives you an inside look at uh, North Korea. Um, it's a Pretty interesting place. Okay, that was the Korean War. Um, let's talk about the culture of the 50s here. Okay, shifting more to what's going on in America. Here's the key points. Number one, we recover from World War II and we do pretty good, right? Even though there's a whole war in Korea, we're still doing pretty good. A lot of soldiers come home and a lot of babies get born. These people are known as the baby boomers. Cars really changed America. We're going to talk about that. There's the creation of the suburbs, right? The way neighborhoods are planned, right? Because um, the way our neighborhoods are planned is very different to where if you were to go to like a place like in Europe or elsewhere in the world, there was kind of the creation of the service sector, um, more white collar jobs um, became available, people working in office spaces, things like that. Um, American companies really kind of went global. Um, so like Coke, uh, I'm trying to think of Mc, uh, McDonald's isn't really big yet, but like Coke would be a good example. Um, you know, other big American businesses are going global. TVs replaced radio, uh, and then rock and roll is born. 
Um, so a lot of things going on in the fifties. Uh, culture. Oh, I think I stopped my share there for a second. All right, we keep going. Um, oh, I included bo uh, these funny boomer memes because why not? Um, this is like this is like an OG meme. This is like from like ten years ago, like in the early days of memes. Um, this was like a popular one. It's like you know, it's like <laughs> the older people telling you like, <laughs> you know, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, had a great union job. Unions are ruining the country. Bought a house in his twenties right? That then you didn't even go to college saying kids have it easy these days. Um, the fifties was a pretty chill, easy time compared to what we're living in now. Um, you know, in terms of making money and making it in America. Um, but we'll get to that. One thing I want to highlight is this thing known as mutually assured destruction, also known as MAD. So soon after World War II ended, the Soviet Union figured out how to uh, make an atomic bomb. And the U.S. and Soviet Union knew that if there was ever a war that really popped off, that both countries, they had the nuclear weapons to blow each other off the face of the earth. And that would be it. Right. Plus, they could pretty much destroy the world. So the Soviet Union, and the United States kind of have to carefully tiptoe around each other, even though they have beef, because they know if it ever really gets hyphy, it ever really pops off it could lead to the end of like the world nuclear annihilation annihilation right mutually assured destruction i shoot a bomb at you i know you're going to shoot one back at me then i'll shoot one at you you'll shoot one back and then after a couple more bombs the entire world is done scary stuff could still happen today other things about the 50s um the 50s was just generally kind of cringy and weird um, it was almost like a weird fake reality time period where everyone was like really happy, not really talking about sexism or racism or anything like that. Like even and not, you know, there's a threat of nuclear war, right? This is why we do stop and get under the, you know, uh, you know, we have active shooter drills now, but 70 years ago was get under the desk and hopefully you don't get destroyed by this amazing gigantic bomb that, you know, your desk isn't going to save you. But you know, we tried to trick people into thinking things were okay. And a lot of historians often argue that just the loss of World War II and kind of our victory, we, they made Americans feel like chosen or better. Um, like World War II was the apocalypse and the Americans were the saviors and those who, the Americans that were left were the fortunate ones and we've made it, we've conquered, we can do anything, right? Um, so even with the threat of nuclear war, there was like this subconscious feeling that Americans had that we were gonna be okay. And that led to kind of weird, cringy stuff. Um, and we'll get to that. Um, soldiers come home. This is big, right? After World War II, there's this thing called the GI Bill. Um, and that gave returning soldiers from the war oper uh, more incentives and economic opportunities to start businesses, uh, go and get educated, uh, getting financial aid, easier time to buy homes at a discount, right? And so the economy really took off of this because, you know, people were starting families, investing in businesses, going to school. Um, buying homes this is all puts more money into the economy and creating um, a lot bigger economy and more business going on. But if you were like a person of color, you didn't really get the GI Bill. You weren't eligible for it um, because racism. And this is a great example of institutional racism, right? So you could have been like a Japanese soldier. You could have been like a black soldier, right? Um, but you were never really guaranteed this GI Bill. And that's a huge problem right because it's like that you know if you're able to buy a house a house is one of the best ways to gain wealth property in this country if you can get property that's how you can get wealth and if you're talking about entire groups of people that can't even attain that right that's only going to make the wealth gap between like white americans and like people of color greater people of color are going to stay here but white people are going to gain wealth 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 with wealth comes power clout status so this is a great example of institutional racism, right? Things that happened 70 years ago that have caused problems today and inequities today, right? And a lot of people don't think or realize that. People are like, racism isn't real. Like, I, I, don't, I don't see color. But the problem is that, that whatever that might be your opinion, but like, that's not how history in America has always been, right? And that's a problem, right? Because people are not on the same playing field, right? Even to this day. People are not on the same playing field. And a lot of it's with our history. Okay, let's keep rocking. Shout out the boomers. Um, so you've probably heard the term, okay, boomer. You've seen those memes. 
Um, so a baby boomer was born in the 20 years following World War II. A big part of that is because, you know, soldiers were coming home. Things were pretty good. The economy was good. You know, there was this whole weird, we are the, you know, Americans, we're going to be fine. And so people just started having a lot of kids. Um, and you kind of tell here on the graph, especially, right, not a lot of babies being born here from 1941 to 45 kind of has to do with, you know, um, uh, has to do with, you know, obviously a lot of soldiers are away fighting and all of a sudden they come home, time to have a family. And then it kind of gets back down a little bit lower. And uh, today, if we were looking at it, the numbers would be like way down here. Um, but these are the boomers. And this is like one of the largest demographics of people today. There are a lot of boomers still left today. Um, and a lot of them hold really old views, right? Um, I think that's why America has really struggled to gain a lot of political and civil progress and societal gain, um, right? But this is just to understand a little bit about the baby boomers. This is like some advertising and propaganda. Not really propaganda, it is in a way of propaganda, but it's mostly advertising that was in the 50s. Again, it was really like, everything's fine, it's great. These are suburbs, right? These are the earliest suburbs, all built kind of the 50s, 60s, 70s, right? This was the family watching the TV, this cool new thing, right? It had like five channel channels, kids like staring right there. Um, this is like a creepy girl looking at, it looks like someone's spreading jam. That face is very scary. Um, kid wowing out over spaghetti, okay? Um, it's family riding on a seven up bottle. Um, again, everyone's just having a great time, even though there's crazy things going on. Um, nuclear war right around the corner. Racism's hella crazy in the fifties. Um, and that's something that's important. A lot of these advertisements noticeably absent anyone who's like a person of color, right? Um, that's kind of big. Okay. Um, make sure you take note of that, right? I just showed you all those advertisements wasn't one person of color, right? It was kind of like, this is what we think of as the nuclear family, right? Mom does all the housework. That was the expectation. You were working at the home and that's all you were ever gonna do. And you're gonna take care of the kids. And dad wore a suit and tie or he was in the military and he made the money and it was his house, right? Um, that's kind of what this is, the nuclear family, right? You're obviously not gonna see any LGBTQ stuff at all at this point um right all white family right no interracial none of that right nothing that we would see today but that's just how it was back then talk about artists uh music things popular at the time elvis presley one of the biggest artists of the, to come out of the 50s you have other people frank sinatra that's marilyn Monroe, john wayne athletes like uh wilt chamberlain right these are all really big people of the 50s um this is kind of the fashion for the dudes uh you know Culturally, there was difference, right? Zoot suits were pretty popular among like Hispanic people, um, but even like non-Hispanic people would rock a zoot suit. Leather jackets, a lot of the gel in the hair was really popular at the time in the 50s for if you were, you know, um, if you were a dude. And then women, it was kind of more like, again, the, the, the slick back hair, the really uh, kind of the poofy hair, curled hair, wearing a hat or a bow was pretty popular. Um, the pattern dressing dresses, right? Um, that was pretty popular at the time. A um, lot of different patterns and colors in ways were popular. Hot rods and cars were super popular. If you're a car head, this was like the best time to be alive in the 50s. So many really cool, colorful cars. Today, like every car is like black, gray, silver, something like that, right? It's kind of weird when you see red even purple green like you don't see a lot of those colors but back in the 50s you could have all different types of paint jobs and it was really cool a lot more colors um in the 50s for cars um and with cars and with soldiers coming home with people having families more and more people started wanting to drive and we now have a president known as president eisenhower and he was a formal a former general in world war ii and he became president during the 50s. When he was in Europe during World War II, he noticed that the Germans had this thing called the Autobahn. The Autobahn was kind of used as this big freeway system across Germany. It was used to move people around, but it was also used in case of emergency if people need to evacuate or the military needed to move 
places, it could move effectively on these big roads. And so Eisenhower like was thought that was a good idea, especially the threat of nuclear war against the uh, Soviet Union. And the car companies and the auto industry was super down for this as well. So they put a lot of money trying to get people to buy into this. And so then in 1956, we get the Interstate Highway Act. As a result, more people hit the roads, the trucking industry takes off, and it pretty much kills the use of trains, which is kind of sad because if you go to like a place like Europe, you can get on a train, you don't even need a car, and you can get around anywhere pretty much in Europe. And that's kind of cool. Um, Europe's like better connected for that. And to be honest, if we still had trains today, we wouldn't have as bad of traffic. Um, you know, if we had more public transportation, like just like a bullet train alone, which California has been trying to build for like 20, I don't even know. Well, not that long, like 12 years now. Um, you guys were just babies when that, when that thing first came out. Um, and that's still, it's facing all these challenges, but expanding like train use and stuff like that would be huge. And, uh, it would definitely help alleviate traffic. But unfortunately the interstate highway act kind of really committed Americans to being all about cars and driving. And that's kind of where we're stuck today. That's President Eisenhower. Um, and it definitely was a good idea. It served its purpose. America was never really connected kind of before this, right? And this finally connected Americans, but it only connected them through car and it really killed the train. So now they're talking about maybe pumping more money into the train systems and maybe having what Europe has, or even in Asia, they have really good train systems, but only time will tell. All right, y'all, that's my video for the day. Make sure you follow along, do your work, and I will talk to you guys later.